us 200 francs. Oh, so we knew it had to be France to go to. That's it, it'd be, it'd be secret, but if you get yeah. francs, as a fair. No, nothing to buy when you got there, you couldn't buy anything. No. The script that you got. And we did buy camembert cheese. Mm -hmm. We smelt it and flung it over the hedge. Uh -huh. It's got a hell of a smell, but I tell me it's great cheese. I see it's on some of the menus. It's, qu remember. it's quite popular. I don't like it myself right now, but I like it. Alright, so uh, was it actually was it on D-Day itself that you went? Yeah, that you landed on the? Was it on D-Day itself that you landed on the on the, on yes, the beach? Yeah. Yes. We were there about seven o'clock in the morning. Uh huh. There's the ship I went on, Clan Lamont. Uh huh. And that's a diploma I got from the Normandy French. Uh huh. Not that, not from this lot. No. That's from France itself. That yeah. Medal. That's from the Normandy French. I got a wee medal for them somewhere. I don't know where it is. Uh huh. And I was still not saying anything about that one. And, uh, and that ship did about five journeys through Southampton to Normandy, back and forth. And it was scrapped in 1968 in Japan. Uh, a bit ironic. Was, uh, the clan line. Yeah. The clan ship. Aye. And so uh, a boy brought that picture of it for me. And to get to Normandy, all of us are salt craft. We had 16 assault craft on board. And every one of them got damaged on the beaches. Uh -huh. And they were supposed to come back and take us. We were second wave from the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. So, what they did was, they flung a great big net over the side of the ship. And they brought us forward and says, climb down that bloody net. And they says there'll be a tank landing craft empty coming back from the beaches and it'll draw up alongside. And he says, get down, he says, and when it comes up near your shoulders, the top rail, grab it and somebody will pull you head over heels. And that's yeah. how we got ashore. And I had a chute yeah. rigged up at the front where he put all his pack and his rifle mm -hmm. down in there. And the Navy. They had already been in there with that tank. Aye. They didn't want to get in again. They wouldn't have fancy it then, would they? So they dropped us about 300 yards off the beach. Mm -hmm. And I was up to here in water. It's lucky you're tall, isn't it? Uh -huh. mm. And there was a way, the, the, the smallest man in my unit was in front of me. Uh -huh. And he turned around to me, he says, Jock, he says, I'll drown. And he would have, mm. you know, because I was only about five feet. Mm. I says, no, he'll not drown, son. I says, put your arms out like that. And I says, I'll get behind you, and I'll come in behind you, and I'll, I'll float you in, because we all had these Mae West mm -hmm. inflatable things. And I floated them in. I said, let me know when you get your feet on the ground. So he says, I've got my feet now, Jock. He says, right. he says, Jock, he says, you saved my life. I said, I'll get the money later. <laughs> and he came from Geisley in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. And he was there on about Harry Ramson's fish and chip fish shop. And That's where he was. Aye. Aye. <coughs> I never saw him again. No. Yeah. Typical Englishman, of course. Uh, Yorkshire, <laughs> Yorkshire <laughs> bumped you. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, when you got on the beach, what was your job? Well, uh, when you got on the beach, we've been told that there'd be tapes laid down off the beach as quick as you bloody can. Mm -hmm. So with these tapes, we got inside of the tapes and we're up. And we got up there and the officer says, he says, we'll do a short, we'll take a shortcut, get us away from the main road. So we're never thinking. So we get this road. Four or five or six uh, Canadians lying dead on the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. He says, try not to look at them. Couldn't do anything else but look at them. So we got skittered and we them and we got past them. And there was a gate. And he says, we got under the gate. And uh, there was something hanging on the gate. And I looked up and it said, Achtung, meaning. I says, this is a, rhyme, a minefield, sir. Oh, he says, we'll dig in. I says, dig in in a minefield? Hmm. Oh, perhaps not, he says. He was right green, you know. Uh -huh. So he and the sergeant went away up another bloody side road onto the main road. He brought us back onto the bloody main road and of course we were late to get into where we should be, mm -hmm. which was a great big field where the Germans had been living in for about four years. 
and it was all beautifully uh, fenced and all that, and, and biting boards on the ground and all like, uh, And we were in that was our billet in there. Yeah. Uh, they look a lot better than a fox on a leaf field then. The other half of our unit, the, the other lot, they thought we'd got lost. Mm -hmm. and, we and I got landed for a, a guard the first night. Mm -hmm. And he went to go around that way, and the other half went down that way, and he met, he had a password to say, mm -hmm. can. and there was one dead German lying in the middle of the field. We had a look at him, we were still not a touch things like that, because there could be booby trap, he can. Yeah. But uh, we couldn't see any wounds on him or anything, so mm. whether he'd taken a heart attack or what, okay. Maybe the blast for a shell or something. Yeah. Just, no, no. And he was there for ten days, and then a boy came to pick him up, a mm. truck. He says, uh, will you give me a hand? Well, I said, no, I says. I says, that's not our job, I says, we didn't, we didn't get with that, I says. That's your job. I says, and I said, I want a receipt. A receipt? I says, anything that leaves a, an ordnance depot gets a receipt. You must provide me with a receipt. We're only really kidding them on. Uh, you know, that's true, we can't take on you and yeah. the ordnance depot without getting a receipt for it. That's uh, so he went away and he came back. Uh, oh, I says, come on, I says, give a hand. I says, come on and I'll give a hand. Uh, and the block is as stiff as a board after uh, 10 days. Uh, and put it in his truck and away he went. It's half to you. Yeah. I says, oh, never mind the receipt, I says, to get away. So it was your job to provide support for, uh, your job uh, on the, the yeah, depot there was? Our job there was, can these big DUKWs, the Ducks, mm -hmm. yep. they come in loaded with stores, and we had to get our climb up and look in and see where was the main store. And they would say, first, second or third place where they had stores, dumps for clothing, motor spares and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they would get up there and chuck them out in. Yeah. And they would go around and then what they had when they came back, we had an area there and I said, if you kind of get rid of them, put them in there and I said, we'll take them round with hand carts. We had hand carts, you know. And uh, that's what, that was our job. Uh -huh. And sometimes there were lorries and uh, we'd be out on the road watching them again coming in there. An the officer there, he was a uh, uh, horrible bugger. It was dusty June, Ken, dust, mm. dust getting our eyes. And I knew that we had goggles that we could get to keep the dust away from our eyes. So I asked him if we could get them from the stores and put them back again. Certainly not. Certainly not. <coughs> and we found a lot of bicycles that were. He, cr he screwed them up, mm -hmm. okay. and he had one of them. He had screwed the buggers. And he, yeah. didn't know, okay. yeah. he had to go back to Lady Britain. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> there wouldn't be much I lost to you, really. Eh? Oh, I was some of the officers, I never think he can. Yeah. You know, you'd think that the first year was to look after the bloody men. You would think so, eh? But not. Yeah. Look after number one. It must have been really, really busy in the stores, though, because ah, yeah. everything. It was coming ashore for, on, on the beach at that time, right? I know. I mean, we were, we were, at that time, about the, the, the Camembert cheese. We were walking along the road, and uh, there was about four or five of us, and we were having a good laugh about the cheese he can. And this posh car pulled up. Hey, you men. Where are you from? We're from I'm from Beach Ordnance. We're Beach Ordnance up here. When did you come ashore? I was on D-Day, sir. Drivers, drive one. Because they didn't come ashore on D-Day. They were yeah. much later than that. Uh, I didn't want to get into an argument about it. No. <coughs> uh, so, uh, when uh, did you move away from... Uh, when did you move on from the beachhead? Uh, uh, that's another story. Mm. Knocker and I were left behind because there were a lot of Londoners there. English, mm. Scottish and Welsh. Mm -hmm. Found that in the army, mm. they joined Scottish and Welsh, uh, put aside. Mm. London first. So, when the, when the beaches was finished, the officers had other jobs to do, and they took the Londoners mm. with them. And Knocker and I were left on the beach. 
So that's all right. And one day, an officer came and he said to me, get your kit together. He says, in half an hour you're going with me. So he didn't ask an officer where to or what. He got my kit together. I met Knocker. Where are you going, Chuck? I says, I'm going with this officer. I said, I don't know where I'm going. What about me? I said, I don't know about you. I said, I'm not a day with us. I'm just doing what I'm told. <clears throat> so I left Knocker there. So I got on the truck. And off we went, you see. And we drove for quite a long while. And we got to a place in uh, Bruiseville or something like that was called, I can't remember now. And it was a mobile officer shop, number 50 mobile officer shop. And the reason I was there, the land scope of the Londoner that had been taken away had been found. No tunic on, a cigarette sticking out of the corner of his mouth, and shouting to officers, Catch this, sir! And a colonel had been coming down at him. Get that bloody man off of there! So I got his job, and he went back to the beaches. And I never heard a, 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 a man speaking to an officer like he did. He called them yeah. all the bloody names on there. Huh. But I was a kid. I was quite happy because I got, he got reunited with some of the mates that I knew, Scots people there. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that was me, mobile officer shop. Yeah. And our job was to get, we got a, 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 a number. And we got there and there'd be a division coming out the line. And we served that division. But the, 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 the major, he couldn't buy anything from our boss until about four days because the fighting troops got order of battle. Mm -hmm. They could buy from us. Mm -hmm. Maybe something they lost or stolen or strayed or different things. Mm -hmm. And if we had it, we sold it to them. And then we used to write it a chit. And, and British officers, as I a bank in London, British officers only. Mm -hmm. And they paid for that through their bank in London, whatever they bought from the officer shop. But they gave for nothing. No. <clears throat> so, I made the mistake, a warrant officer, and I didn't know that he wasn't an officer. Yeah. Was an officer. But he knew. He knew he wasn't entitled to buy it, and he bought no. a, a trench coat. So we went back, and they said, uh, it's, it's really our fault, we should have informed you that the you know, warrant office does not qualify for to buy But he says, he knew, and he says, he'll be bloody sorry. And he was in front of the bloody colonel. Uh -huh. He got all again off, he the bloody off, he took the coat off him as well. Yeah. And he says, come out there, it's like a wee laddie, and he's bumped right now. Well, even if you have to go on his record, you see. Aye. <clears throat> Especially a warrant officer, that's like... Uh, so I never forgot that. Yeah. Yeah. But what I did know is, when I went there, I went to 49 there. And there was quite a nice major there. And uh, he said, uh, he said, I know I said, I'm not allowed to take anything, but he says, have you got anything good? I said, I've got a nice jeep coat, sir. Mm. Hmm, that sounds nice. I said, I'd like one of them. I said, well, I'll let you try one on, sir, just to get your size. And I said, I'll keep it for you for four days. I thought, keep the bone. So he tried it on. Put it away a size for mm. four days. I said, you'll get that after the line of troops. And he was quite happy, and he said, he had a loud hailer, and he said, Sergeant Cook, report to me immediately. And the Sergeant Cook came up there, he came to me. Sergeant, see these men there? There's three of us, you see. He says, any of these men want when they're here, they get no bloody nonsense. He says, they must be looked after. You know, so we did. Mm -hmm. So we did. Just up, right? <laughs> so it's nice to know who's in the fence. Aye. Uh, so did you? Uh, did, uh, did you go off? Did you go through France and into Holland and into Germany? 
Nej. Ja, men alltså, 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 An officer came to me, and we were, we were in Billy up in uh, Billy Shakes place, um, and Phillips place. Mm -hmm. We were Billy up having a cup of tea there, mm -hmm. and uh, we just moved on from there. And this officer turned up and he says, uh, he says to me, "Don't unpack your kit." He, he says, "Kit," he says, "You're going with me tomorrow." I thought, "God Almighty!" Well, of course, Lance Cooper came. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he turned up in a place called Helmond in Holland. Mm -hmm. He said, Go on me, get on the truck, get your kit on the truck. So we're driving and driving and driving, and suddenly I noticed a hedge, and there were four of these 4.5 gun howitzers firing behind the hedge, woof, into the Reichswald forest. Mm -hmm. Because the Germans had retreated there and taken the people from this town, which I hadn't seen yet, as hostages. Mm -hmm. And when we got to this town, there were still some things burning, and there were no people, empty. And Second Army troops had the officers shop there, and they were moving forward. And this officer says to me, you were in charge of this officer's shop. I says, I'm only a lad's corporal, sir. He says, no, what the hell you are? He says, but that's your job. He says, you're taking over this officer's shop. But he says, there are three soldiers here. They're here to help you. They said, no, we're no. We're going with the, with the boss, the captain. And he says, okay, you go with the captain. He says, I'll tell you something. You'll be back here tomorrow. No, no. And I saw something I never thought an officer would do. When I went away, they had the minister's house, three-piece suite, tied up to his trucks, and away he went with a smudgy three-piece suite. Yeah. And I thought, that's terrible, I thought, that's terrible. I didn't mind the Canadians coming up, because they came up and they opened the bloody windows again. It came uh, washing machines and all sorts of stuff, pianos, mm. and all of those things. Uh, I drained into Brussels to the black market, mm -hmm. big 10 ton trucks, that's where I learned, of course. When the people came back, they went to the Lysol Forest, the bloody house was empty, and they were looking at the neighbours, and the neighbours had pinched them again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing left. There was then. a bloody pandemonium for a few days. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> So after the, the, the war ended, eh? after the war ended in 1945, did you stay in Germany? Yeah. In the army yeah. occupation? I was still to stay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in charge of this officer's shop, along with these three lads, but mm -hmm. mainly, I enjoyed myself. Because mm -hmm. we opened in the morning at 10 o'clock and shot at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And there was a train, left Gennep, was in Gennep. G E W N E P, a small town. There was a train left Gennep for Brussels every day. And I thought, well, I'd come back again, you see. I thought, I wouldn't mind a day in Brussels. So, well, I arranged with, with our four of us that one week one of us would go down to Brussels. And he went over to the camp, and if he could get some Dutch guilders, Get them changed for Belgian francs. He had Belgian francs to buy in Brussels. In Brussels, he could buy anything if he had Belgian francs. Mm. When I went down there myself and had a, a, a meal there. Yeah, good stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. But before that, I had been in uh, in Brussels on a, a more tragic situation. I was in Turnout in Belgium. And Turnout in Belgium is famous for playing cards. That's where all those playing cards are made in Turnhout. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was there, a letter came and said that uh, one of the one of the unions could get a holiday or a thirty-eight hour pass in Brussels uh, once a week. Nobody wanted to go, and I said, "Well, I'm wanting to go." So I volunteered, 
and now went and she's done. We've got a movement order for three other lads from another unit and she's you're in charge of them. <clears throat> so I went into the Hotel Royal, right in the middle of Brussels. Mm -hmm. The Royal Hotel. So I went in there with the four of us. And I met a, a, a Canadian sergeant, he says, he says, you'll need to get out of here, he says, the Limey Hotel's along the next street, he says, right along the end. I says, Sergeant, I'm not a Limey, I says, I'm a Scotsman. And I says, I'm not moving, I says, I've got an order here for the Hotel Royal, and I says, this is it. He says, but he says, I'm telling you, this is a Canadian hotel, I says, I'm not listening to you, Sergeant, I says, that word order has to be obeyed. <coughs> so he was a bit upset, I was McKeown, so an officer came along, what's going on here? So I, I gave him the order, I says, uh, he says to the sergeant, get his men built, he says, no bloody nonsense, he says. So I had a room to herself in the hotel, got hairdressers and you know, shaved and all of this, and so that's us. Mm. But the man that brought us up, when he came back, he had to bring somebody, another one from our unit. But when I came down in the morning to go back with him, he wasn't there. So I says to the man, I says, where's the, the driver for that? Which is the way back. I says, where the hell did he go back for? He says, one of your men got killed on the way up. I says, oh God almighty. Whew. And he says, because he looked at him. Well, he says, his name was Poole, I says, it's not Poolbrook, he says, hi, that's his name, 19 year old, he'd been sitting in a truck with his arm around the, down the hoops, mm -hmm. and this Canadian pulled out of the convoy, struck the truck, he couldn't get his arm out, he pulled his bloody arm out, yeah. and dead away away, oh Christ, and we were left, <clears throat> I said to myself, Christ, what am I going to do, no transport, so I knew that I could go with a train, so I explained it to the boys, I says, the only thing I can volunteer to get you down to, to get near his unit is I've got friends in a place called Lear. And I says, uh, they know me. And I says, we'll get a train for a place called Duffel. Yeah. And that's where the Duffel bags and Duffel coats got their name, a place mm -hmm. called Duffel in Belgium. And I says, we'll get off a train at Duffel. And I said, we've got a bit of walking to do to Lear. And I said, and we'll walk to my friend's house. And I said, I'll knock them up and tell them what's happened. They'll let us sleep on the floor. At least they'll be out of harm's way, we'll be on the floor. And we did. And I told them I was probably getting killed and all that sort of thing. Because uh, we, we, I was built in a big house there. And it was a man that made secrets for ladies' handbags and stuff like that. And I had, a, I had a billet in there. No, these other lads, they were in a different unit. So who slept there? And in the morning, uh, we went out onto the road and we got a jeep, an American jeep coming along. I was giving them a thumb from the stop. And jump in the And they take us to our spot, which I knew. I said, get off here and we'll get another thumb. And we did. And they got them home. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, they said to me, where are you from? I said, I come from Hoyk in the border. Oh, he says, we've got a Hoyk man in the unit. I says, what's his name? <clears throat> he says, Jimmy Taddy. Oh, I says, I know Jimmy Taddy, and I said, I know his brother Guido. I said, the father and mother have got a, a lovely coffee there called the Cardora. And I says, uh, oh, he says, Jimmy says, he's got a, a billion saloon, he says, but he says, I think he's Telling us stories. I says, no telling his stories. And I says, he's got a two story billiard saloon in Bridge Street next to the, uh, the museum there. I says, and Jimmy, Jimmy thought he's got, uh, Daddy has got a, a double story. Oh, I says, we thought he was kidding us on. No, mm -hmm. no. I says, no. Yeah. So they went away. <clears throat> and then I went back to my, my unit. Mm -hmm. Just after that, what, when did you find out you were going to get the, 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 the sonar from well, the French? I didn't know anything about it, but I got a visit one morning, mm -hmm. and it was Bill Waters from the British uh, Legion. Mm -hmm. 
and they had a, a lady with him called Janice, and she was what is known as a befriender, and she was with him. So they turned up, and he spoke to me about this one, he says, he says, do you know, he says, you're entitled to get uh, the um, Legion Donner medal. I says, no, me. I'll get you a form. Mm -hmm. We've got a form, and they filled it in for me. <coughs> I signed it, my name, and I wrote in different things that he didn't account about you can. <coughs> <coughs> and eventually, I got a letter from the ambassador, uh -huh. French ambassador in London, uh, telling me my history. Uh -huh. And he says, You have been promoted to a Chevalier. Uh -huh. I don't know what a bloody Chevalier yeah. was. Some said he meant Chandelier. I said, I said, yeah. I said Shut your face, you bugger. I said, Anyway, I'm a shining light as if I'm a Chandelier. <laughs> so there's a nice letter in there in that bag. Uh -huh. And uh, then the Portobello branch, I became a member of the Portobello branch, mm -hmm. and they took over. And they made it that I would have a reception because it mentioned in the letter that, mm -hmm. I, that they would provide a reception for me yeah. to be, have the medal bestowed on me. So, so mm -hmm. it developed from there, and it was to get into that. Um, that house hotel along, Rock, Rockville House Hotel along Joppa, near Joppa. And I got the date, 4th of May, 4th mm -hmm. of April, mm -hmm. 4th of March rather, uh, to be there about just before after 11 o'clock in mm -hmm. the morning. And I could have family members and things like that. And I turned up there. Mm -hmm. And it was to be a, a mademoiselle because the, 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 the consul was called back. Mm -hmm. the German to, to France, and she was taking over the role, and her name was Emmeline, nice, nice woman, and uh, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew four French words, you see, mm -hmm. and uh, of course when I was shaking hands with her, I says, uh, Enchanté, mademoiselle, she said, I think you know some French words, I says, me, oui, mm -hmm. courvoisier, mm -hmm. that's a brandy, yeah. And I says, uh, Vive Crico, Champagne. Oh, she says, you know the good stuff, she says. <laughs> I says, say bon pour bon Napoleon. If it's good for Napoleon, say good pour moi aussi. Mm -hmm. Good for me also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she, she was getting her so laughing about that. Uh, yeah, and stuff. So I uh, spoke to her again later on. I had a piper play me in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, well, well, yeah, I've seen your fog up in the paper when I was quite a day there. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably... That's probably that was probably. me. Yeah. Excellent. Over DD, I fell asleep. Nice hot cup of tea, Aye, I'll make a tea. Uh, <laughs> so is there anything else you would like to say? Uh, 